When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to the Garage Party, wherever you are and whatever you may be doing. Thank you for listening and thank you for joining the party. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, co-hosting and master of ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, the captain. It is good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening and thanks for telling a friend. What a beautiful tuxedo you have there, Captain. This week, we will be rolling out the red carpet as we celebrate you, the listeners, us, the host and your favorite garage studio. This week marks a very impressive podcast milestone of 500. That's a five followed by two zeros episodes. And to celebrate this most impressive of milestones, we will count down our 10 greatest true crime garage trailers of all time. That's right. It's a feature of our show that most true crime shows don't have. Each week, the captain composes some great music and pulls a clip or two, or maybe the colonel does a little write-up for that week's case. Each case that we have covered here in the garage is unique, and each week the trailer that we put together is just as unique as the case that we are covering. So, please, join us, won't you, as we celebrate you, the listeners, for making this possible. Back when we started in 2015, we didn't think anybody would listen to two beer-drinking dorks recording in a garage but now it's almost six years later and we have one of the best brightest and most beautiful audience in all of true crime podcasting and so this week we celebrate you heck many of you have been with us since 2015 or 2016 and we truly hope that you have enjoyed the ride as much as we have This week, to celebrate in a proper fashion, we are drinking Angel's Envy Kentucky Straight Handcrafted Bourbon. Call me old-fashioned, Captain, but I believe real bourbon comes from Kentucky. Garage grade, of course, five out of five bottle caps. So to all of you out there in listener land, that's right, I'm talking to you. Friends, colleagues, True Crime Garage Army, and citizens of Parts Unknown. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, raise a cup, your glass, a tall can, be it bourbon, coffee, wine, beer, or soda, because this one is for you. Let's talk some true crime. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Son of Sam.
I am deeply hurt by you calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I'm a little brat. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Behind our house, some rest, mostly young, raped, and slaughtered. Their blood drained, just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and I watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I'm on a different wavelength than everybody else, programmed to kill. However, to stop me, you must kill me. Attention all police, shoot me first, shoot the killer else. Keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks, too many heart attacks. It hurts, Sonny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in Our Lady's house, but I'll see her soon. I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt, my life. Blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more. No, sir, no more. But I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to the yahoos. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I want to wish you all a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next, and for now I say goodbye and good night. Police, let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, bang, bang. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. can't believe that one is only number 10 because when you say the chubby boo <laughs> when chubby you say behemoth ch- the chubby bohemoth hey i just said it uh david berkowitz wrote it yeah but you won the the emmy for that the uh funny thing here that's episode 21 of true crime garage way back in the day and that one look i promise it's not going to be this scary the entire top 10 countdown i mean between the the your friend over here that is weird me out that you invited into the garage to to count them down 10 10 that guy mortal Kombat. he refuses to tell me his name he's just staring at me weird mm-hmm. between him he's the chubby bohemian <laughs> right between him and the uh the son of sam trailer there i'm uh i'm on edge man i'm on edge this is supposed to be a party i'm supposed to be having a good time bang 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 that was a great trailer, and of course, that was the uh, son of Sam who wrote that trailer essentially themselves. Captain knows how much I love any time we have a case that involves writings from the killer or letters sent to newspapers or taunts sent to police or even uh, TV news outlets. It's weird to be a fan of something like that, but it's one of those situations where I find it incredibly intriguing. I find it very interesting that someone would take it to that level and have to fill some kind of weird need of communicating with others while they're supposed to be hiding from police. And instead it's a, it's a taunt. It's, it's to mock the investigation and mock the public who is afraid at the time, but it dramatically, he loves Queens. 
dramatically increases the risk that the offender is taking along the way as well. Yeah, and I believe that was our first dramatic reading during the trailer, and it was, uh, I thought it was effective, but it was also, it felt a little silly also at the time because of the words like chubby bohemoth. But let's get into number nine. And the media make you think that a black man arming himself is illegal or criminal or that he wants to arm himself to rob a liquor store or something. You know what I'm saying? That is for me to defend myself. And it should always be. It's just about surviving, you know, and we have to be honest about the tools that we use to survive. And why is a black life um, any, any more recuperable than a white life? You know what I'm saying? We know that they don't put the same security in the ghetto that they do and the whites in the, in, in the white neighborhood. So therefore, for me to be out here saying, don't, you know, put your guns down and no violence, that's hypocritical. And if I didn't talk about the violence, everybody would act like the violence wasn't there. We, as rappers, bought that violence. We, we bought the, the violence that we've seen on the street. We put in our records, put in our records for years. And after three, four years, people first, finally starting to see it because of all the statistics that's going on in the streets. If we stopped talking about it, then they wouldn't take statistics. And when they stopped taking statistics, then we'd be killing each other in the street and these white people wouldn't care no more. Only people they, only reason they care is because, you know, there's been some strays and we just slipped over in the white neighborhoods. And there's kids in Iowa that want to be like us. You know what I'm saying? There's kids in, in Indiana that's trying to be like us because they can relate to you know what i'm saying you even admit it i don't live in that neighborhood anymore there's no real reason for you to carry a nine millimeter don't believe that why in, the, in two years i've had a gun pulled on me by my limo driver by police by everybody you know what i'm saying and i better be i better be you know what i'm saying i've been attacked you ain't read the papers about these skinheads trying to blow up black churches why they see me as the enemy just like y'all do. You know what I'm saying? They can come to my house and sit outside my house just like anybody else can. A skinhead. And once my life is gone, it's gone. Can't nobody give it back to me. Not the judge, not the president, not the governor, not Calvin Butts, not Jesse Jackson. They can't do nothing but come to my funeral and talk pretty about how black people suffer. And once my life is gone, it's gone. And obviously, that's the late, great Tupac Shakur. Those are episodes 112 and 113. If people want to keep track, keep score at home and go back and check out some of the old episodes, maybe we are presenting trailers to you that you are hearing for the first time today. Yeah, it's a nice feeling when somebody messages you and they say, for example, let's take the Tupac Shakur case. And they say, oh, I just watched this documentary. I would love to hear you guys cover Tupac's case. And you go, well, go to 112, 113, and you can check it out. And they get so excited because they don't have to wait. They don't have to go, oh, well, maybe right. they'll put it on the list. Maybe they'll do it in a couple months. Oh, it's already done. Awesome. And also, I think it's just a nice feeling. I think when we started doing the podcast, it was just to see if we could do it. I don't even remember if we ever talked about putting it out like before we, we tried. Before we sat down, flipped on microphones. Yeah, it was just simply, hey, would you like to try a podcast? Would you like to try to do one? Not, let's put it out for the world to hear. And then once we did a couple, we're like, well, let's just put it out and see what happens. And <laughs> 500 episodes later. The people that we meet at CrimeCon that tell me they're like, you know, I've been with you guys since the beginning. I give them an extra big thank you because I'm like, you are a very a understanding <laughs> and patient person. We used to get up in the middle of recording and go get a beer and keep talking on mic. So it's, it would sound like this. Hey, uh, I'm going to go to the fridge and I, I'm coming back and now I'm back and here we am. And I think you cleared it up and said it better than I did. I said, you know, when we started this, we didn't think anybody would listen to two guys in a garage. Uh, but you're right. We're recording it, not even with the idea of putting it out or releasing it to the right. world at the time. 
Uh, it was just something to set up and see if we could do. And if, if it's painful to listen to one or two of those first early episodes, it's because we're in pain. We're sitting we in a, in a garage. that was like 110 degrees yeah. and the beers dripping. Yeah. The beers were necessary just to try to keep us uh, cooled down to the point that we wouldn't Hydrate. expire during the, <laughs> the actual episode itself. And while we're doing this here, captain, I want to make sure we give out some uh, beer fund shout outs along the way. So raise of the glass. We're going to be raising the glass many times this week as we celebrate, but a cheers to lace in Austin, Texas, and a cheers to Jennifer and Avon Lake, Ohio. A lot of cool, a lot of beautiful people on Avon Lake. You know, I have a question because I mean, we get some analytics from the show, but I'd really like to know where we're like the craziest or like the most interactive fans are. So on the blog this week, how about you go and just put your name and, and what state you're from, Texas, Ohio, wherever, California, California. And maybe I'll do a special like we did the, the Ohio true crime garage shirts. Maybe we'll do whatever state wins. Well, and we have a tendency to see in from the blog itself that we often get the most comments or questions about a case where people are from that area where right. the case took place, which is just kind of a natural thing. One thing that should have been a natural thing, Captain, is I should have went back and figured out when the first episode that we did an actual trailer for, you know, because we're kind of here celebrating these trailers. I love that we have the trailers on the show. You do such a great job putting together the music. And, you know, we've been very lucky to have such a good audience, uh, such a good hardcore audience that stuck with us for so long. But I've had some people that are, are trying to come up through the ranks of the true crime podcasting. And they, they want to know like that, that you and I, they somehow think that you and I are holding on to some very well kept secret, which is not really the case at all, but they want to know what, what is it that, that you guys do that, that has set you apart from some of the others. And I actually think it's, it's the, the drinking. I think it's the trailers. Uh, I, I've always thought that it, it puts a theatrical spin on that week's case. And again, like we said in the, uh, in the little lead up to today's episode, mm. each case is, is unique. And we respect that and understand that when we look at each one of these cases and we try to keep that in mind at all times when we go into it, doing the research and putting together the presentation for each case. And we do the same thing with the trailer, with putting together the trailer each week. We well, don't want you to tune in. I, it was a horrible idea because it's like the, the amount <laughs> the amount of music that has to been, you know, to create every week for the show is there's a lot. Um, it, it was maybe if we would have decided, hey, every big case will do a trailer, every like big popular case, but the other ones we won't. It's a lot of uh, a lot of music being made for the show. Well, and those of you that have been there from the very beginning, or maybe you found the garage at some point and you went back and you binge listen to all the old episodes to get caught up, you know that we didn't always do the trailers. And in fact, back when we did Son of Sam, the episode number 21, back then it was more common for us to do a single episode for a case. Yeah. Um, and we didn't always do the beers right out the gate either. That was something that kind of happened organically. I think well, we had the beer. We had the beers. We were drinking them. And what they was, were from everywhere. They were from everywhere. But what was funny was I was... I would pick a six pack of a beer that was kind of hard to find or at least hard to find at the time because you were driving up to see me and I knew it was going to be hot would be sitting in the garage. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to get a, a beer that we both can enjoy. That's not the run of the mill everyday beer to be something kind of special. So we were always drinking a special beer, but I don't think the beer of the week popped up until there's a, I think you asked me in, in one of the episodes early in one of the episodes is, well, what are we drinking this week? And mm. boom, now there's the, uh, the, and boom, now boom. there's the beer of the week. <laughs> boom. Genius idea. 
Well, and also, I don't think we ever got drunk in the first few episodes because we were just sweating it all out. <laughs> I mean, so if somebody goes, hey, man, this first episode, you sound like a dumbass. It's like, well, I sound like a dumbass on the new episodes. Uh, but I'm just a lot clearer because I have a better microphone than I had back then. That you do there, Captain. All right, a quick shout out to Justin from Hurricane West Virginia and a shout to Kimberly from New Woodstock, New York. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to number eight. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of the West Memphis Three. The West Memphis Three. Damian Eccles. Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. The West Memphis Three. Damian Eccles. Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. The West Memphis Three. The West Memphis Three. We've had three children missing since last night. Three young boys murdered in cold blood. It appeared that they had been sexually mutilated. Is it your opinion that these crimes were motivated by a cult belief? Yes. The West Memphis Three. Arrested at 2.44 p.m., charged with three counts of capital murder. It was like a nuclear bomb going off in the courtroom. In a statement given to the police, 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly allegedly confesses to watching two other suspects choke, rape, and sexually mutilate three West Memphis second graders. In 1993, the small Arkansas town of West Memphis was robbed by the gruesome killing of three eight-year-old boys. A police investigation brought murder charges against three local teens. Damian Eccles. Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. This is not just Terry Wayne Hobbs. I don't know how much clear I have to make it. None of my DNA was there. None of the West Memphis Three's DNA was there. What makes you so sure it's off? What makes you so sure that it's Terry Hobbs? Pardon me. What makes you so sure that it's Terry Hobbs? Well, his DNA was found there in the lace of Michael Moore. <laughs> David Jacoby's hair was there. What did it do? Fly there on Harry Potter's wand? <laughs> <laughs> it either fell off of Terry Hobbs or he was there. There's no other two ways about it. None of the West Memphis Three's DNA was there. This is not just. Damian Eccles. Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. Jesse Miss Kelly. The West Memphis Three. Damian Eccles. Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. The West Memphis Three. This is not just. Just. West Memphis Three. Old Mark Byers. And of course, those are the West Memphis Three cases. 40, 41, and 42. And we were just saying on Off the Record the other day, we probably could have <laughs> done about 30 episodes on West Memphis Three because it seemed like, especially in the early days, that that was a case that both of us loved to discuss over and over and over. Yeah, I think we were saying maybe we would just uh, go back, revisit West Memphis 3, and cover it for the next two to three, four years, however long it takes <laughs> to, to figure it out. Uh, no, that was one of the first three-parters that we did, as you pointed out, episodes 40, 41, and 42. And you're right. At the time, didn't it feel like three devoting three hours, maybe a little more to a case, was, was a lot? 
Like, yeah, this but, is going to be heavy lifting. It's going to be difficult to put together. It might be difficult to fill the space. I think our average one parters were already starting to get into the hour 15, hour 20. Now we also talked a little bit slower back then and our delivery wasn't as good and there was a lot more spaces. I don't think we spent as much time editing the episodes. Well, you'll have people that will say, look, they did all those documentaries on the West Memphis three. It should be easy to fill three hours or three and a half or four, whatever it ended up being. But well, half those documentaries are just Metallica songs and with visuals, with right? Visuals. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not actually talking to fill the space. There's, and, and to be honest with you, I think we broke it down in our coverage of it, how little actual case information there are in in those three, in the trilogy, the Paradise Lost trilogy itself. Uh-huh. Now, but we both consider them to be brilliant documentaries. I mean, they're they're fascinating to watch. I don't get tired of them. Yeah, but look, part one, episode 40, hour and 12 minutes. Episode two, an hour and 36 minutes. Episode three, an hour and 51 minutes. This is, I think, at the point where I started realizing it's hard uh, with, <laughs> with, you know, to, to condense it down. And you don't want the episode to be two hours long. That's intimidating. Yeah, it's hard in the streets and it's hard <laughs> in the garage. And it's hard in the streets of West Memphis. The uh, the thing too is I think we spent the majority of the second episode that it took us an hour and thirty because we were going through the timeline in such detail that we were trying to show that hey look while we agree that the documentaries are the Paradise Lost uh, documentaries are very entertaining and whatnot they spent a lot of time building a case against Mark Byers and we spent a lot of time in that second episode tearing down that case against Mark Byers, because when you look and you review the timeline of events that people agree upon, that that more than one in the inner circles of these six families involved and the police and the neighborhood and such, you see that there's very little time for Mark Byers to have done anything uh, as, you know, to, to have harmed these boys. And of course, now all these years later, even before we covered it, we know that there are different circumstances to, to look at and truly analyze during that. But it was, it was something that we were happy to put together. And again, like you said, captain, it was a case that we were very passionate about back then. We were very passionate about it in the nineties. It was, it was one of those ones that we always knew we would cover it, but it was about wanting to try to cover it the best way we knew how at the time. And I think we did a fairly good job of that at the time. I thought we, I thought we nailed it. I thought it was a home run. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's so part of me wants to applaud ourselves because we took on a giant challenge probably before we were ready. I mean, but let's be honest, like we said, we we started a podcast to see if we could do it, you know, not to start putting them out. So then once you get to a challenge like that, you go, oh, that's pretty good. But I remember the following week going, yeah, this is pretty good, but like we could have spaced them out more maybe this should have been six parts you know um or 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 possibly even more and so now when i look at it and if i mean just off the top of my head if he said to me you need to cover west memphis three i'd go that's going to take you about 10 to 12 episodes well and that was a a helpful learning experience for the two of us because it allowed us to know and understand for future cases that are of that size or that popularity, that there's that much information out there that three isn't going to be enough. It just won't be. And look, I, I'm happy to applaud ourselves for what we put together back then. Of course we've gotten better. Heck, if we've not gotten better from episode 40 to episode 500, then we're really we're really doing something wrong and, and really have gone backwards. There's a, there's a listener out there right now going, hey, boys, you sound the same to me. <laughs> well, hopefully they're still listening because they, they love the show and love the garage. Two people that I love, Lindsay in Atlanta, Georgia, Nona. You don't hear that name very often. Cheers oh, to Nona, Nona in Rogers, Arkansas, which is very fitting to 
fall there with the West Memphis three. Kick. Thank you to everybody for the B W E W R U N beer run. Yeah, these aren't just random names that we're shouting out. We're doing the beer fund shout outs a little bit differently this week because, hey, we're partying it up as we go through our countdown here in the garage. But everybody, if you hear your name, you helped us fill up the beer fridge for what's going to turn out to be next week, right, Captain? Because we're we're enjoying some Angels Envy today. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. All right, cheers, mates, to the people in the back, to the people in the front. More importantly, cheers to the people being bussed in from out of town. We's love you. Cheers to Sarah and Dan in Cincinnati and Christy, who is very mysterious, says she's somewhere between Portage and Springport up in Michigan. So I hope that that doesn't mean that she's lost up there, Captain. I'm somewhere between... Extremely ugly and extremely sexy, so figure that one out. Figure that out. Dial that up. Dial that one in. See what captain you get. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what number? Are we? So those those were our first three, right? That was our first three, yes. So, Counting's not our best. No, we have, we're, we're drinking the hard stuff this week. Or maybe it's called the easy stuff. By but, my calculations, Captain... That would put us around number seven, right? Yeah. Counted down three already, seven to go. Party's kicking, party's happening. Let's go with number seven. The following is a BTK offender criminal profile. This profile was written several years after BTK's first set of murders. It reads, The attached analysis is only as good as the information that has been provided. In addition, it may be necessary to totally change or modify this analysis if new information is developed, 
such as additional victims, more forensic evidence, or more information obtained from research. Multiple Homicides, Wichita, Kansas The murders of the offender known to the public only as the BTK are the result of a fantasy acted out. A fantasy where for the first time in his life he is in a position of dominance. He is an inadequate type, a nobody, who through his crimes has placed himself in a position of importance. The BTK Strangler is now a somebody who is receiving the recognition he feels is a long overdue. He is not even very original in his crimes. He has patterned himself after other killers, such as the Son of Sam in New York City. Most of the verbiage used by the offender in his letters probably comes out of recent publications in detective magazines. The subject is alienated, lonely, and withdrawn. He would not be expected to have any lasting relationships with others and would lead a solitary existence dominated by fantasy and magical thinking. His killing is an attempt on his part to find affection and acceptance. He fears everyone, including himself. He would not be expected to have had any normal relations with women and probably has never had a normal heterosexual relationship with one. When he is not killing, he experiences intense feelings that he is not normal and therefore he kills to cope with this disorder, an attempt to escape within his own fantasies. Thus, he can be expected to kill again and to do so in a compulsive repetition pattern that he has already established. His victims can be either male or female, who are both loved and outgoing. His victims will be in a position of vulnerability where he can totally render them helpless. His victims represent his own feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. His own life has been disruptive. He probably comes from a background where his family was broken. He was raised by an overbearing mother who was inconsistent in her discipline, and his father was absent, either because of marital separation or death. This would have occurred when he was a youth. Your subject may have been raised by foster parents. Your subject was an average student in the classroom. However, he was more adept to disrupting the class by using profanity and pranks. His language and statements make us believe that he has some military experience and or is a police buff. He probably has had run-ins with the police in the past, such as assault and or breaking and entering. During these break-ins, items taken will be items of insignificance. These items would have been taken because of a fetish or to feed a strong urge to take an article of clothing or an item that he is fond of or the satisfaction of committing a crime that will leave little evidence to investigators. BTK may have a history of voyeuristic activity and he may have an arrest record for these types of offenses. He hunts his victims by selecting neighborhoods where he can peruse different houses without being detected. Furthermore, his victims will live in an area where, if need be, he can have an easy escape route, such as a neighborhood park where he can hide to elude police. His killings are impulsively motivated and without elaborate planning. He seeks out targets of opportunity. Such individuals of this type suffer from insomnia and thus find it difficult to hold steady employment. Control of himself and of his environment is essential to such a person. Although he is gaining in confidence, he is still shy, withdrawn, and isolated. As a counter-strategy technique, your department must not make any statements concerning the killer's mental condition. Do not allow the media to label him as some kind of psychotic killer. If they have already done so, your best strategy will be to align yourself with the killer and not the psychiatric experts. Any press releases should clearly state that he is a killer who must be apprehended and that he is not a psychotic animal. This approach may reduce the killer's anxiety and reinforce his own guilt feelings. This removing any psychiatric excuses for his acts and leaving him responsible for his murders. 
extended periods between his murders may be for reasons when he was absent from the area, either as a result of military service, schooling, incarceration, or mental treatment. It is not uncommon for subjects such as yours to frequent police hangouts in an attempt to overhear officers discussing the case. Such offenders may be at the crime scene observing detectives investigating the case. All of this allows the murderer to fulfill his ego and gain a feeling of superiority. He may go so far as to telephonically contact your department and provide details specific to his crimes. Your advantage in this case is his very strong self-centered attitude will be his downfall. He will provide information to a friend or an acquaintance at a local tavern concerning information he knows about the case. He may even pretend to be an officer working the case. He may carry a fake badge on his person. If so, he may use this to gain entry into his victim's homes. BTK will continue to kill until he is caught or killed. One of my favorite characters in the Mine Hunter series, BTK, because you don't really get to hear him talk and you don't know when they're going to start looking for him. And he's so similar to BTK in real life. Like, looks like they could, you know, um, they, they casted the character very well. Well, and us as the viewers, we know what he's up to. So right. it makes it even a little more intriguing when they, you know, when they break and then they show BTK for a little bit. Maybe he's dressed up in one of his costumes. Maybe he's standing there in front of a burning barrel, tossing in pictures and drawings that he's made. Now that, that trailer is a great trailer. That was from May of 2018 when we did a four part series on the BTK, who is one of your favorite characters on the Mind Hunter show, which I'm hoping season three mm. sometime. I hope they're working on it right now. But it is one of my least favorite serial killers. I hate the BTK, hate Dennis Rader, would love to squash him like a bug. That was another one of those guys that taunted police and the public with his letters and whatnot. And contacting the i believe he even used the phone one time to call in something to the local media or to the police but 2018 may is when we did the four-parter on btk captain i remember 2017 and 2018 early part of 2018 we were getting a lot of requests to do more expanded uh, deep dives into these different types of cases, be it solved or unsolved. We were getting a lot of requests mm -hmm. for four parters and we were I, happy I to the four parters. We were happy to oblige. Uh, Seems but, like uh, we haven't done a four parter in a while, but I guess a few months ago, what we did the Unabomber, right? Well, not only did I read the trailer there, captain for BTK, I provided the screams for you at the end of it oh. as well. That was some that's of my. You, that's when you see a bug. Some some of the, my finest work. Yeah, yeah, like George. Like I swallowed a fly. What do I yeah. do? What do I do? Uh, but yeah, that was uh, some of my finest work that I've done here in the garage with those screams. Um, yeah, Unabomber. Uh, not too long ago, and you're right. Maybe we need to hear from the people. The people will tell us what they want. The people in the front and the back. And we are happy to. Uh, we are happy to uh, answer all requests. Yeah. We're almost to the halfway point. Let's get to number six. is a broad and fascinating crime. People murder for love and for hate. Some murder for money, others 
for want of money. Some people murder in a cold, insane rage. And some people murder with the calculating skill of a butcher. Some people use guns or knives or their hands. Some people murder children exclusively or women. And some people plant bombs in high traffic locales. And some mail them to specific targets. New York City's Mad Bomber, a case featured here in the garage, was about an angry and yes, very much a madman who terrorized New York City for 16 years in the 1940s and 1950s with explosives that he planted in public places. Bombs were left in phone booths, storage lockers, and restrooms in public buildings, including the Grand Central Terminal, Pennsylvania Station, Radio City Music Hall, the subway, and the New York Public Library. For 16 years, a period stretching back to 1940, the largest, most formidable police force in the nation had failed to hustle up any worthy leads. By 1956, the bomber's handiwork showed a lethal new proficiency. He declared his deadly intent in letters sent to newspaper editors. Each rambling, raging letter was cryptically signed FP. Desperation drove the police to pursue a course they never before considered in the department's 111-year history. NYPD was going to consult with James A. Bressel, a psychiatrist with the expertise in the workings of the criminal mind. If physical evidence could not lead the police to FP, maybe emotional insights could. Since a physical description of the bomber was unattainable, New York police believed maybe Dr. Bressel could use the evidence to draw a profile of the bomber's inner self, an emotional portrait that would illuminate his background and disorder. Bressel told them that the bomber was a textbook paranoid schizophrenic. People suffering from this disorder, he explained, may believe other people are controlling them or plotting against them. They are typically reclusive, antisocial, and consumed with hatred for their imagined enemies. For all their derangement, they're capable of acting quite normal until inevitably some aspect of their delusions enter into their conversation. The paranoic is the world's champion grudge holder, Bressel would explain. We all get mad at other people and organizations sometimes, but with most of us, the anger evaporates eventually. The Mad Bomber's anger does not. Once he gets the idea that somebody has wronged him or is out to hurt him, the idea stays in his mind. The bomber, Brussel continued, almost surely operated as a lone wolf. Paranoids, quote, have confidence only in themselves. They are overwhelmingly egocentric. They distrust everyone. An accomplice would be a potential bungler or double crosser. Ultimately, Dr. Bressel was correct in his assessment of the evidence which was simply the bomber's actions, words, and intent. This specifically helped NYPD identify, locate, and apprehend a domestic terrorist that eluded them for 16 years. The Mad Bomber, later identified as George Metesky, was angry and resentful about events surrounding a workplace injury he suffered years earlier. Russell called his approach reverse psychology. Today, we call it criminal profiling. Decades later, in 1980, after four attacks, the FBI created the Unabomb Task Force. During the 80s, they failed to identify the Unabomber, and then he went dormant. The Fed suspected the terrorist could be dead, but then the attack started up again, and in 1993, things at the task force were ramping up and a new wave of agents with differing array of expertise were brought in to work the case. Its would-be assigned task force agents all received a rather large memo titled Major Case Number 75-Unabomb. For well over a decade, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies around the U.S. investigated the case they dubbed Unabomb. By the mid-90s, the perpetrator was the most wanted serial killer in the United States, and he was one that none of his victims had ever laid eyes on. An individual so mysterious and elusive that he was known only by the case codename the FBI had given him. 
Unabomber, since his early bombings were directed at universities and airlines. Unlike the one big crude blast of Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh and his cohorts, the Unabomber's attacks were more like that of the Mad Bombers, but unfortunately more destructive and deadly. These bombings were spaced apart. This perpetrator could wait and act over time. He was more specifically directed. He was clever. He was diabolical. And his motive was wrapped in layers of mystery. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of the Unabomber. You, like Robert Stack, have a nice cadence to those well, trailers. You. And you know what? One thing we do that's just polite, you'll notice that we often say in a trailer, this is True Crime Garage. That way, if you ended up here by accident and you were looking yeah. for a different show, we yeah. let you know so you don't have to wait to the end to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like when people go, hey, uh, I normally agree with you guys, but this last episode... We were, we don't seem to be on the same page. Right. And they say, uh, you know, whatever case it is. And then I look it up and I go, we, we didn't cover that case. Right. And, <laughs> Wrong show. <laughs> and then, I, then they go, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. But you uh, know, but we're also polite too, because when we fart, we say, excuse me. Well, and some people, you know, maybe a lot of people listen at work or at the gym or during their commute. And, mm. you know, we're we're one of the better flavors on the block, but maybe. A bunch of psychopaths just maybe pumping people, iron, yeah, listening to murder. People need more than one flavor, and so they tune into different shows that they like, and they get jumbled up sometimes and go, you know what? You guys really, really laid a stinker this week. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, we don't, we don't know what case you're talking about. We, we so didn't cover that one. Please direct that stinker elsewhere. Well, True Crime Garage, what flavor are we? The drunken flavor. All right, so tomorrow we we go to the top five. Oh, prepare yourselves for the top five. The one we just heard, Unabomber, episode 482, as the captain pointed out earlier in this episode, we did a four-parter on Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. It, though, look, the world would have been a better place had that guy just accidentally blown himself up during the constructions of those yeah. bombs in his little little shack that he was living living in there. Hey, but to celebrate 500 episodes, will you please do us a huge favor? It helps out the show. Go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review, and we'll love you forever. You can leave some kind words there, or you can just simply hit the five star button and submit that awesome review. We need it. We love you. We appreciate everybody for helping us to get to 499 and 500. Want to give a quick shout out to Leah and Kona, Hawaii. Sounds like a beautiful place to be. Never been myself. And a shout out to Anna and beautiful Delaware, Ohio. Uh, Delaware and Hawaii, they're very close. They're pretty much the same thing. Basically the same. And don't forget to check out our other show that's taking over the world off the record available on Stitcher Premium and check everything out at the store page on truecrimegarage.com. Join us right back here at the Garage Party tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.